gonna um, plug my head pocket on to make sure that everyone can still hear me. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Rhonda. I, I think it's also a fabulous tour. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, that kind of brings us into our, our question answer period. I hope everyone enjoyed um, that pre-recorded pre -recorded version of the tour. Um, I think what I'll do first, maybe, um, if just because there were a lot of questions that were asked, um, like as we kind of went along, maybe I'll just ask a few of the questions first as they came up in order. And then, um, and then after that, we can, we can kind of open it up for people to ask if they have any other questions. Um, so I guess the first one, Edgar, is that it was from Rhonda and um, they were wondering what kind of cows you have on the farm um, specifically. And, um, and then when we were looking at the creek uh, at the very beginning of the video, um, how you kind of man, uh, manage manure and nutrients um, sort of around the creek to make sure that there's no potential runoff and contamination. Yes, hi, uh, Rhonda. Um, most of those cattle that you saw in the picture were either black Angus crosses or red Angus crosses with Herefords or limousine or some other beef breed, um, but predominantly they're Angus bloodlines, which is a, a European species of cattle that's well adapted to uh, pasturing in areas like Scotland and Ireland and places like that. The um, question about the, the runoff of nutrients and, and manure, uh, because the biological activity of the soils is so high, um, any of that manure that the cattle deposit becomes incorporated into the soil within approximately 10 days. Uh, within a few hours of a manure pat coming onto the soil, it forms a natural um, surface skin that seals it off and stops the um, nutrients from going into the air and all the earthworms and um, dung beetles and microbial life eat that um, manure from coming up out of the soil and it's gone. It never runs off. It never goes into the uh, water. The water is absorbed downwards into the grasslands because they're so spongy. It the water never moves laterally over the grasslands. So basically, um, we can graze right up to the edges of the waterways. You saw that all the waterways are fenced off. Um, there's no cattle that actually go into the stream or the ditches. There's that riparian zone of a couple of meters on either side of all the waterways. And all the water going into the stream is um, very, very clean and natural. Does that answer your question? Yes, hope, hopefully it does. Um, and if, oh, awesome, yeah. Um, so the next question is um, from Audrey and, and I think you touched on this a little bit, but maybe you could just reiterate is how long um, can the cows stay on the grass, like, you know, on each um, section, I guess. And then does it depend on the period of year or um, does it also depend on whether or not they're calves or young males and bulls and things? Um, well, it's a, a long question to answer, but um, basically we put all our animals of all sizes and types together into one herd, which is the natural way of herding animals. They don't select themselves with just young ones or old ones. It's the whole family together. And normally uh, a group of animals in a herd will stay on the same section grassland for eight to 10 hours at a time. And that's about what we do. 12 hours is um, maybe average depending, but um, they're ready to move on once they've eaten the top, say one third or um, a half off and they wanna move on to get the next fresh green. So 12 hours um, for us is about an average time that they stay in any one particular um, field or paddock. Great, thanks. Um, and Jackie is wondering how uh, long you've been farming regeneratively and what brought you to, 
to farming regeneratively? Well, it's very interesting. When I grew up on this farm, um, my grandfather, he farmed naturally. That's way our grandparents' generation farmed. They, they followed these regenerative methods. It's not something new that I've created. I've basically gone back to what I grew up with from following what my grandparents did. It was only through the, you know, the periods of the green revolution that farmers like my family got away from farming regeneratively. So we returned back to it when my brothers and I came here back to the farm in the 1980s and we've been doing it since then. Great. Um, and Natasha is wondering where you sell your beef or your other products as well. Um, we sell a portion of our beef locally here at the farmer's market. Um, we have a natural pastures cheese um, business that has a cheese factory downtown Courtney and we sell our beef at that store um, as well. But the majority of our beef is sold in Choices Markets in Vancouver, the Lower Mainland, Abbotsford and Kelowna. Wow. Um, and um, another question we have from Rosina is how many grazing fields do you have? Um, I know you said the property is uh, um, over 700 acres, but I guess in terms of actual um, fields that the cattle are moved from, um, how many, yeah, approximately how many fields do you have for that? Um, about half the farm is divided up into one hectare paddocks, which is two and a half acres approximately. And then what we often do in those paddocks is when we let the cattle in uh, for a fresh uh, meal, we'll split them in half by putting an electric wire down the middle of them so they can get a, um, two salad bars a day out of a one hectare paddock. And, and that would be with like a hundred animals in that paddock. And the other half of the farm is open, it's not fenced. And so we go around with um, electric fencing and put the uh, wire up on a daily basis in an area that would be a half an acre to two acres, depending on how much space we need for that day's salad bar. So it gives us the flexibility to adjust the size of the paddock. Um, so we don't really have a, a set number of um, grazing paddocks. We decide every day kind of how much the cattle need and we give it to them. Okay. Um, do you, um, a question from Catherine was, was curious about um, sort of how the rest of the Comox Valley is taking to regenerative farming? Like, do you see this as um, something that's growing or are you kind of an outlier? Um, do you, do you have any ideas of kind of what it will take for other farmers to get on board or, you know, what other farmers are doing in the Comox Valley? Um, there are several farms in the Comox Valley that um, uh, farm following regenerative principles. Um, I couldn't tell you the percentage of how many farmers, um, but I know um, probably a couple of dozen or so that in the Comox Valley that, that try to follow similar types of ideas. Um, what it takes for farmers to do this uh, is a good question, and I don't think I have the answer to it. <laughs> um, they certainly is not a lot of incentive in social or government policy to encourage farmers to do this. Um, so I really don't know exactly what would um, uh, give somebody the desire or want to do this other than it comes from your own um, care of the soil and the land and the animals that you farm with. That was what kind of drove us to do this. It's our health and it's our animal's health. And we were interested in, in doing that. So that's why we did it originally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's certainly in, important. Um, a question from Rhonda was, um, 
was wondering how many head of cattle are on your land altogether. Um, I know you've kind of talked a little bit about the amount or like the size that they're broken up into. Um, but uh, yeah, just curious about how many head are, are on the, the farm altogether. And then um, how big your barn is for, for when you keep them in the winter. Okay, um, our herd size varies. Um, I think the most animals we've had is around 700 and um, probably um, the lowest we've had is probably 200. Um, our barn is capable of housing uh, about uh, 600 animals. Uh, we have four barns that um, used to be occupied by our dairy herd and our beef herds. And um, we probably today, I'm thinking the animals you saw, there was approximately 300 animals that you saw today. Wow. Um, okay, and Natasha was, um, where did you learn about biological soil assessment or do you know of anywhere where you can learn more about how to do that yourself? Because you, you do soil testing yourself. Well, I, um, I'm a professional agrologist by training and I studied soil science. But when I did study it years ago, nobody taught biological farming and anything about the biological activity in the soil. I had to go out and follow my own um, readings and, and listen to other people and, and look around the world. I, uh, as a professional agrologist, I worked in many, many continents before I came back to here in the 1980s. Um, there's a lady and her husband, um, Dr. Elaine Ingram, I believe probably if you look up the soil food web or Dr. Elaine Ingram, I would think she's been probably foremost in my understanding of the biological activity in the soil. And there's lots of other people that I have studied as well and read and, and listened to. But I think if you want to look at a one uh, world expert, that she would be the person that I would look up online. And, and she has lots of YouTube videos and uh, courses that you can learn from online. And um, I believe she's probably the world's foremost expert in soil biology. Awesome. Um, another question from Natasha was, does your farm have a succession plan to keep it in production? Um, that's probably one of the weakest points of our farm is that we have no succession plan for the next generation to follow on with this type of farming. My brothers and I, we have many children, but they are not interested in farming and um, there's very little incentive or assistance to help uh, beginning farmers take over a farm like this from somebody like ourselves. So it could be that this will come to an end very shortly. Hmm. Um, uh, kind of a question from Catherine and then a follow up question from Audrey, but um, are there any sort of education activities on regenerative agriculture for youth? in the Fraser, or sorry, in the Comox Valley, or do you run any sort of educational programs at your farm um, for youth who maybe are interested in like, um, in doing something like this in the future? And then, um, and then also, do you know of any government programs that support um, sustainable educational, like sustainable agriculture um, education? Uh, generally, I'm not aware of much support anywhere for somebody to learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. um, I do do tours of groups and field days, but that's about all that I do. Yeah. Um, and then I guess a last question, well, was from Jackie and um, they were asking if there's any other farms like this in BC, which um, you have talked about how there are several dozen on in the Comox Valley. So, and there are plenty of farms like this across BC as well. Um, and then another question was, um, how big are your paddocks? Which um, I believe you also spoke to as well. 
um, they're two two and a half acres, one hectare, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. There there are other farms all across the province that are farming in similar ways and means. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I have no idea knowing the total amount of that type of farming, but there are people starting to do it more and more. Yeah. Um, awesome. So those, those are all the questions that came in that I wrote down while we were watching the farm tour, because I just wanted to keep track of them to make sure that um, everybody got those asked, because some of them were asked like, you know, an hour ago when we started the farm tour. So I think now maybe we'll open it up to, if anyone has any further questions, feel free to um, like unmute yourselves and ask um, ask any further questions, or you can pop a question in the chat and I can always ask it as well, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Hi, um, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. I, I learned about uh, this, uh, these uh, multi-paddock uh, grazing schemes from Alan Savory. And uh, one of the things that he um, found was that by managing the grass recovery, you could increase the amount of forage by up to four times uh, from conventional grazing. Can you verify that? Or do you have a number that that might, might be more appropriate? Um, I think what he says is, is generally probably true. Um, if you start from a very low level of some type of grazing and you practice Alan's plan grazing, I'm sure four times at more production, especially on, on a wet, humid um, climate like we have here on Vancouver Island is certainly quite possible and doable. I, I don't have any experience with the drier um, climates, but my experience is our grass um, land production has improved uh, many times over since we started doing this. So over the years that you've been doing this, have you noticed the ability to, to host many more cattle? Um, yes, we can um, um, carry, like I say, at times we've carried up to 700 animals on this, this farm. Um, I, I tend to balance the supply and demand I have for my product. So if I don't have a, a demand to sell it, I, I manage my uh, animals in terms of economic supply and demand as, as well as ecological production. Sure. But, um, okay, I better let somebody else ask a question. <laughs> I've got many more. Oh, that's great, thank you very much. Yeah, we can we can open it up, and if, if anybody else has questions, that's awesome. And if um, if not, then then feel free to to ask more. We can kind of just see how it goes. So if anyone else has a a question for Edgar, Um, one of the questions that came in in the chat while we were while I was asking um, questions from before was um, what do you do for parasite control and do you find that rotation is enough to control internal parasites? I don't do anything for parasite control. Um, I, I don't seem to have any issues with internal parasites in the cattle or ruminants on the farm here. Um, I find the natural rest periods where the grass is um, exposed to the air and the sunlight uh, seems to break down the transmission of um, parasites because of the rest cycle of the grasses. Um, we do have other species grazing the farm. There's probably 150 black-tailed deer that graze with the cattle. Uh, during the, the winter time, we probably have about 300 trumpeter swans that come in and also graze the grasslands. So we do have other species grazing on the grasslands in between the cattle cycles. So I suspect the natural biodiversity that we have, there's enough of it that it controls these natural parasites and pests 
And the animals develop um, a strong immunity by being um, able to live in this um, grassland and express their natural resistance to diseases and parasites. Um, knock on wood, I can't recollect the last time I could even remember seeing an issue with parasites in the cattle or any of the ruminants here. Interesting, yeah. Um, another question that came in from Rhonda was um, that they're wondering if the main herd is divided into smaller herds or if it's just the one that's moved around from pasture to pasture. I, um, at times through most of the year, I have one large herd that does the grazing. And the reason I do that is the larger the herd, the more incentive that herd has to um, eat the grass without um, selecting the species. And that's what I try to do is get a non-selective harvest of the energy in the grass. Um, at this time of the year, I split the herd up into two um, because um, when I do take them into the barn, I split them into two into two separate barns. And so what I do is establish the, the herd pecking order and the herd mates and um, their relationships to each other before they go into a new environment. And that way they're not stressed if I took them into the barn and tried to split them up into new groups and they would have to do all their social organization in an unknown um, environment. So that's basically what I do is I keep them together most of the year, except for now when I'm getting them socialized before they go into the barn. Yeah. Um, and a question from Natasha is how many people are required to run your farm? Um, on the farm, there's myself and my brother and my aunt that you saw on the ATV. And we are the, the three people that operate the farm. Awesome. Does anyone have any, any for, further questions? Feel free to sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in again. Um, uh, I'd like to return to the question of uh, supposing the demand were very, very high. What do you think is the potential that your land could support in the way of uh, cattle? Assuming economics was not the issue, you could uh, sell everything that you could produce. Um, on, on this farm and the stage we're at in our um, development of the soils and the grasslands, I feel in today's climate, I could carry roughly 500 animals or more that I could um, um, easily graze on these grasslands with confidence. Mm -hmm. And if I, I wanted to, I could probably add another 100 or take away 100 as the years uh, vary in climate, but I would feel comfortable on average 500 animals a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's about what you are managing right now. Yeah, give or take. Um, at the moment, I'm, I'm only about 300, but okay. um, I do build up numbers through the year and numbers go down through the year. Mm -hmm. And have you, uh, do you ever do comparisons with conventional uh, cattle raising farms to find out how much more profitable or comparable you are? And, uh, does the economics of it, uh, have, you, have you studied that at all? I've never studied it for um, the beef cattle, mm -hmm. but when we had our dairy cattle, um, when we took over the um, conventional dairy farm that our parents had, and we went back to doing this grazing and, and grassland production, um, we found that it lowered our costs about 40%. Wow, okay, yeah. But I don't know for the beef production. I, mm -hmm. I've never studied it or compared it to other beef farmers. Right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. 
fascinating work you're doing. <laughs> Is there any other questions from, um, from anybody else? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, just as a quick introduction, my name is Ania Cameron, and I'm a guest of Edgar's. I've, uh, Edgar and I have worked together for about 21 years. Um, so from your experience and observations, Edgar, what would it take or what incentives would be effective in a... Um, encouraging and allowing young farmers to be able to consider and then um, carry on with uh, owning or running your farm. Uh, relating back to the question on succession. Well, I'm not really sure. Um, when my brothers and I bought this farm from our parents, it was just after the agricultural land reserve had come into British Columbia. And there were incentive programs at that time to help us as young farmers um, go out and secure loans and guarantee the payments and guarantee the interest rates. And there were about four or five incentive programs that were very useful for us to take over the farm from our parents and have them retire and be able to live out their lives with enough um, retirement funds. Today, all those support programs are gone. There's, there's nothing left. The, the promises made when the land was taken from the farmers and put in the ALR are all gone. There's nothing available. So a lot of the tax policies in Canada and in British Columbia are also against um, supporting young or beginning farmers to take over a farm because the way capital is taxed. And there are other countries in the world like New Zealand that forgive taxing capital for beginning farmers. And there are other countries in the world that will support young farmers financially to get started. And I suspect if um, that was available that you could go out and, and make a loan and guarantee the payments and um, guarantee the interest rate for a 20 year period like I had when I started, um, probably young farmers or beginning farmers would be able to, to buy and, and carry on farming in British Columbia. At the moment, I'm not aware of any incentive or any way that a young farmer can get started. Hmm. I don't really have the answer. It's a, it's a, a difficult um, issue in our society. We've taken the land and tried to protect it, but um, we haven't protected the farmer and his livelihood. And we certainly haven't protected the succession of a farm from one generation to the next by the way we tax or by the way we provide incentives. Um, it's a social policy issue. And I think agriculture in regards to so social policy development ranks very low on the scale of interest in British Columbia. I have no um, really anything really that I could suggest would be useful other than it, somehow money needs to be made available and it needs to be there for a period of years for a farmer to get started. It's very expensive and um, it takes time. Mm -hmm. Those are great points. Thank you for that question. Um, does anyone have any, any more questions? Okay, so I've got another one. Yeah, absolutely, um, please. <laughs> Um, this uh, uh, research and experimenting you're doing with regard to the seaweed that, that the cows are loving, uh, when is it projected that uh, results will be 
um, be able to be reportable. I, I'm hoping the end of this year, beginning of next year, there'll be some results. Thank you. Great. Oh, you're welcome. Is, is there a place that those are going to be shared or um, like if, if people were curious about looking that up in the future, where would they go to look into that? that I'm not sure where the results will be shown. Um, okay. Professor John Church at Thompson Rivers University is the person that's um, overlooking the, the uh, research. So I guess, suppose somewhere in Thompson Rivers, there'll be hopefully some way of accessing the results. Mm -hmm. If, oh, pardon me, but may I ask another question? Yeah. I'm being, I'm being like, uh, is that Mr. Jackie or is that Jackie? I've <laughs> been asking questions. Um, so, um, if I go to a choices and I don't see um, your beef, um, well, first of all, I presume it's labeled so that it um, is recognizable. Um, is it because the supply is not there or is it something to do with the store not ordering or what, what can I do in order to get the beef if it's not there when I go there? Um. Our beef is um, branded as natural pastures beef in some of the places we sell it and it carries that label. I believe in the Choices Market Store, um, it's either their source of grass-fed beef or organic certified beef. It doesn't carry the natural pastures label, but I believe if you go to the website on Choices Markets, it will list our natural pastures beef as the source of their certified organic grass-fed beef. And um, I'm not sure the reason why it's not carrying the natural pastures label. It's an in-store decision to market it under their own label. But if you ask the meat uh, manager or the meat department in the choices and ask them for the natural pastures beef, they should hopefully be able to indicate what it is or where it is. Thank you for that clarification. That's, it gets complicated. Yes. Yeah. Does anyone else have uh, uh, any other questions? Um, some of the questions that were submitted by because um, there's there's some folks that unfortunately weren't able to to join today but they signed up and and so there was questions submitted um, when they signed up and so maybe I'll ask a few of those as well um, someone was wondering what is the smallest area of land that can support multi-species rotational grazing um, do you have an, a kind well, of you could use your your backyard if you wanted to um, i worked in lots of places in in the world where um, the farm would pasture one animal and they would take it out on a rope and tether it with a peg in the ground and they would move it to a new place every day so if you want to put a, um, a goat on a, on a rope and pasture them in your backyard, you could start on that size of a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think size um, is the determining factor on, on grazing um, grass or using grasslands. It's like I say in my thinking, it's important that you manage the health of the size that you're grazing and you match the size and number of your animals so that the the soil and the plants are taken care of and that's what I think is the important thing to look at so you you can add as many animals as you want to whatever size of ground you have 
but manage it so that you're looking after the health of the plants and the soil. Mm -hmm. um, a question just came in from Laura, um, who is wondering, are you involved in the slaughter side of the business or do you use an outside abattoir? We're very fortunate here in the Comox Valley. We have one of the few remaining family run abattoirs in the province. They're government inspected. Um, they've been a family business for many decades and they're about 15 minutes drive from the farm. And it's a, a, an ideal situation to have a small scale food processing facility like that very close to our farm that our animals can go to and not be stressed, not have to travel a large um, distance. And they can do small um, numbers of animals on a regular basis that I can supply to local cuss. Um, I am not involved in the slaughter of my animals at all. I leave it to the experts that have um, many years of experience. And that's my best guarantee of passing on my meat in the best quality uh, and care and healthy uh, state that I could have is to have that type of an abattoir very close to the farm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions that have come up in the last couple of minutes that they're curious about? Anything that they're curious about? Um, yeah, I do. Sure. Uh, I, um, I'm just curious to know more about your transition into um, regenerative agriculture and uh, you know, how, you, how you went about it and what really motivated you to do it. How many hours do we have here? <laughs> 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 I'm still in process. <laughs> it's taken me all my life to get here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I grew up on this farm. I was born here and I grew up, my grandfather farmed regeneratively or naturally. And I didn't know it was an unusual way of producing food. And so I just assumed everybody else did that. But when I went off to university and um, I soon learned that what we did here was very unusual. Other farmers didn't farm this way. And, and everything I learned in university was contrary to what we do nowadays. And then I went on and worked in Mexico and, and Central America and South America. And I ended up having a cattle ranch in Colombia for several years. And it was during my period of grazing the cattle in Colombia that I I got back to doing what my grandparents had done on this farm and realized, you know, there these natural cycles um, are extremely um, efficient. And um, you look at the whole aspect of everything together and um, it, you can't design a different system that works better. And we've lost touch of that. So every year I become more and more aware of that and learn more about it. And um, maybe give me another 20 years and I might be <laughs> understanding of what I'm trying to do. But um, uh, I think as I realized how well this type of farming works and how easy it is and how enjoyable it is, it gave me the incentive to do it more and more and more. And I'm not saying it's been easy. And, you know, uh, uh, you make a lot of mistakes. But the interesting thing to me is none of those mistakes put me out of business mm. or um, killed my family or got us sick or put us in the hospital like conventional farming is doing to farmers on the land that are exposed to chemicals and things like that. Um, if you're 
going out and farming conventionally and you're borrowing thousands and thousands of dollars to buy seed and fertilizers and chemicals and you make a mistake and your crop fails, that's probably enough to, to put you out of business or, or affect your business. Here, if I leave the cattle graze um, too long and the grass suffers a little bit, I just have to give it another month of rest and I'm back in business. So it's a more um, manageable, more forgiving um, type of a, a farming system that a farmer uh, experiences, or at least I experience a lot less stress. And that's really why I keep enjoying it is my level of stress compared to my neighbors that farm conventionally and their health issues compared to the way I feel healthy. So that's one of my main um, areas of interest that kept me in it and keeps me looking and learning and wanting to know more about it all the time. And that's the short story. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering if you'd ever uh, come across Neil Dennis uh, from Saskatchewan um, and, and his ranch um, uh, where he, um, he used to, he, he did experiments on just how, how many pounds per hectare of beef could he put on um, and uh, he got up to about a million and a half pounds per hectare in this mob or this uh, uh, multi-paddock grazing. Um, so it was a bit of a legend, uh, I understand. Uh, he passed away um, in uh, 2019 in the fall and uh, his wife and son are carrying it on. But um, I wonder if you ever met him or came across him at any conferences no, unfortunately, I haven't. I, uh, I wish I had him. Um, I'm wondering, I'm just looking at a few of the, the questions here that came up um, from when people registered. And do you know of, of some of the hardiest breeds to farm in northern climates? Like if someone maybe up north was looking for like a hardier um, breed of cattle, do you know of any? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by up north. You mean in British Columbia? Right. In yeah, in, yeah, yeah, like nor yeah, northern BC. <laughs> um, um, actually, a, a lot of the breeds that I have here, Angus crosses, red Angus, are very hardy. Um, Highland cattle, Dexter cattle, um, milking shorthorns are, are very hardy. Um, so it's not also just the breed, it's the selection of the cattle that are adapted to those climates. So like you, you, you can't take a red Angus from Texas and trans, late, transport them to the Peace River and expect them to adapt easily. You wanna get a, a red Angus, for example, that has grown up somewhere in Northern BC and, and is adapted to the climate. So, but there, there are lots of breeds that are um, adaptable to living in Northern British Columbia. Mm -hmm. I think our biggest issue is going to be how we adapt to the heat stress in the summers, not the cold in the winters. As climate change becomes more and more impactful, for example, in the center of British Columbia, our summers often are getting periods over 40 degrees, and that is very, very stressful on, on beef cattle and dairy cattle and other ruminants. So. Um, but there are, again, um, selections of cattle that have the ability to stand high heat stress. And um, probably in time, we will have to look at incorporating some of those genetics. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just sort of looking through. Um, do you know? if there's any data on the impact of venison or bison protein compared to beef? <clears throat> I'm sure there has, but I'm not aware of it. Yeah. 
Um, and then actually another question that came in that I thought was really interesting because you um, you had mentioned you have a bunch of different um, sort of um, varieties within your grassland, um, things like clover and legumes and stuff. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what your favorite pasture mixes are for rotational grazing and maybe why well, you chose those. Wetland. Sure, I'll, I'll, I have wetland and I have dry land and I have organic soils and I have sandy loam soils and I have clay loam soils. So each type of soil type um, has a whole different regime that goes on in the soil and growing of grasses. So overall, um, I have probably used about eight or nine different types of tall fescues that incorporated into my species of grasses. And I pick fescue grasses that are endophyte free. Endophyte is a, um, it's a type of a sort of a, um, a mold like ergot in rye that can uh, affect the health of, of grazing animals. So I also use a lot of uh, um, perennial rye grasses. I have about a selection of about eight or 10 different types of rye grasses. Um, I use four or five, six, seven, type, seven types of orchard grasses. I use blue grasses. You've heard of, uh, there's very many species of blue grasses. Um, one of the um, grasses that I incorporate is one that's called reed's canary. And I use that in, in wetter areas or drier areas with some of the other mixtures. I have about four or five different kinds of white clovers that are high growing, low growing, um, ones that are adaptive to use in organic peat soils that are more acidic. Um, uh, like some of the herbs like chicory and um, um, I'm trying to think of the other one, uh, plantain, I, I plant in as well. I've used uh, brassicas, pasturing brassicas. Matua is a, um, a very drought resistant grass that I've used from New Zealand um, for the high dry sandy pastures. Uh, what else have I got in there? Timothy at times. Um, I've got some Russian um, rye grasses that come from the northern part of this Russian Siberian uh, soils that are more winter hardy. And I have some grasses that I've selected from parts of Ireland and Northern Scotland that do very well in um, wet peaty soils. And so I have a kind of a real mixture. And over the decades of planting and putting these grasses out, they have selected areas of the farm that they do better than other areas. And um, there's, so there's a bit of a natural selection process going on in the meadows over time. But those are sort of the basis of grasses that I use to start with. Mm -hmm. And uh, so far, they've adapted to our change of climate here over the last 40 years that I've been here. Yeah. Um I'll just, um, just because it relates to what, what you were just speaking to, I'll just ask this one last question that came in from Natasha, which is where do you purchase your seeds from? I have several seed companies that I purchase uh, from here in British Columbia, um, down in the States. One of the companies I like to use around the world is, a, is called the Baron Brug Seed Company, and they have sources of seeds from Europe and Australia, New Zealand, US and Canada. And they have species of grasses that are more adapted to pasturing than making hay and silage. So if I had to pick one sort of source, I would look at the offerings of the Berenberg Seed Company out of Europe. How do you spell that, Edgar? I'm just gonna type it in the chat. E-A-R-E-N. E-R-U-G or something like that. Okay, I'll just type that, I'll just pop that in the chat for everyone and um, hopefully if you Google that. I'm a, um, I'm a farmer, not a speller. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot there. That's okay. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, we're getting close to, um, 
to to 2 p.m. here. So um, I I just want to thank everyone who joined us for this virtual field day, and I think it's really great to to get people to together to discuss um, all of these topics. And so I'm really glad we were able to do that virtually. Um, I also really appreciate Edgar joining us. Thank you so much, Edgar, for touring us around the farm, answering all of uh, all of our questions in livestock farming. Um, we do have two upcoming webinars, just to let everyone know. One is in mixed farming systems and the other is in alternative and renewable on-farm energy systems. So if anyone's interested, um, it's on our website under events. I can also, um, I'll be sending out a participant survey. It would be really awesome to get everyone's feedback on how they felt this this day went. Um, it helps us plan for future field days and webinars. Um, and I can also, when I send that out, I can uh, include the links to those other webinars just in case anyone's interested in joining those. Um, I'll also um, send out a link to the recording once it's done and it's on our website. There's going to be, um, we'll put the farm tour up that everybody already saw and then we'll also include the recording of today's question uh, answer session so that everyone can go on and rewatch that or send it to anyone who they think might be interested in watching it. Um, Edgar also has a salmon hatchery on the farm that he showed me and that we also recorded as part of the video. But unfortunately, because of the length of time for this virtual field day, I just couldn't, I wasn't able to include it, which is really unfortunate. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and compile that into a Kind of like an additional video and then i'll also put that on our website so all of that can be seen at a later date um other yeah other than that i i think i'm sorry to overwhelm you with information all at the end but um but again i just wanted to thank everyone so much who joined and i hope you all have a really great rest of your week so i'm bye bye everybody bye thanks so much yeah.